<laughs> this is our twelfth lesson on biblical hermeneutics, and uh, we're getting we laid a lot of groundwork because uh, we need some background for how we approach the Bible to begin with. Now we're going to get some rules of interpretation, simple rules to begin with. We'll, we'll elaborate more as we develop these, develop a system as we develop this further. There are four fundamental rules that are real simple rules that you're taught in uh, usually in uh, English classes, but perhaps in other classes as well. Uh, you're taught these basic rules. We want to use them in on every passage of scripture that we might that we might study. And so we're going to use these four basic rules. They're the same common sense rules that we use to study Shakespeare or physics or history or any book of literature or other subjects like psychology and so forth. And uh, so when we're studying these things, we need to look at it now. Uh, I would argue that Shakespeare and books of literature would would fit in this better, perhaps than history, than something like math or physics. But there are still some in the, even in math and physics, some of these rules would apply. This lesson will lay a background for introducing these four basic rules, and uh, they are very important for us as we lay them out. They're common in our basic education, whether it's formal or informal education. Uh, and you don't have to have a, a high degree to be educated if you're if you're a person that reads a lot and studies and uh, observes things. You can learn a lot just by common sense and pick up a lot of stuff by reading if you get some good books. And of course, good books are important. The first thing we have to ask is who is speaking. That's our first rule. The second rule we must ask is who is being spoken to? To whom is he speaking? To whom is the speaker speaking? Third, we must ask what is the context of the discussion? What is the setting in which it's placed? And last, we need to know is the language literal or figurative language? So we look at different kinds of language. Now, we can elaborate even further if you wanted to add a four, a fifth rule, but we'll develop this later. But what kind of literature is the literature that you're reading that you're studying? And some literature is uh, very literal and some liter literature is very figurative. And so prose is normally literal. And so poetry is figurative by its very nature. So we have to look at the kind of literature that they uh, use the term genre, G-E-N-R-E, -E, genre. I think it's a French word, okay? But we have several commandments which imply that we can systematically study the scriptures. We're going to look at these, such as 2 Timothy 2.15. Now, the American Standard Version has, give diligence to present thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, handling a right the word of truth. This is in 1901 American Standard Version. This is how it reads. So it give diligence to present thyself approved. You, the King James says study. The old word for study means to work at it. You had to work at it or be diligent in it to present yourself approved unto God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. And he says, handling a right the word of truth. Now, the American Standard footnote says, holding a straight course in the word of truth or rightly dividing, I believe the King James reads. King James Version reads. So we cut a straight course, we cut a straight line. I remember when I was grew up on the farm, we had a neighbor that their, their son would drive their tractor and plant rows of crops. And these were cotton fields. And he would plant the cotton fields and they were a half mile long. You could shoot a rifle down through there and, and go right between the, and not hit one of the stalks of cotton because his rows were as straight as an arrow for a half mile. I never could plow that way, but he could. He could cut a hold a straight course. 
and uh, for some reason, I just couldn't get mine exactly straight whenever I tried to plan. But he was good at it. So let's look at this word, this passage, and look at it in the original. And it says, give diligence. And what it is, it's the word is translated study or hasten. And uh, diligence or hasten. In eight other passages, it translated uh, give diligence. And so it's translated study in the King James. Same word is found in 2 Timothy 4, 9 and 21. And 21 translated give diligence. And in eight other passages. So be hasty, get busy. And we see a person who's not lazy. God does not want us to be lazy and not working in his kingdom and his work and we're to be busy trying to put our, present ourselves this is an infinitive to present ourselves approved <clears throat> now dokimon or dokimos is the greek word here and it's used for coins or metal and the value of a coin back then was in the metal that was in the coin and of course it uh, was backed up by the gold or silver or, or brass that was in the coin. That was the value of the coin. And so you had to check it to see if someone had faked it, if it was real genuine gold or silver or whatever uh, uh, precious metal it might be. That would be the two pri uh, primary ones. And so if this was like you assayed it, you proved it or tried it or tested it. So if you give diligence, if you work at it, you study uh, to present yourself approved so that you might be approved as genuine. Now this dokimos right here, this word right here that I'm, my mouse is moving over, they put an off of privative on the end, but on the beginning, that's the equivalent to our un in English. Some English words that have an off on them, or an a, an a, and that's words atypical, asymmetrical, atheist, agnostic. And uh, most of those words all come from the Greek language, but it's the equivalent to the English un. And like I say, a few words have it in them. And so adokimos is reprobate, someone who has been examined and they've been found to not be genuine. They're not what they ought to be. That's what this means. Someone's got their mic open, so if you would kind of close it, if you would, mute it. And so they present themselves approved unto God. All right? It really doesn't matter whether or not we please men. We, meet, we must try to pre, or strive to please God. So God is the one that needs to be pleased, not, not me. Still got your mic open, whoever it is, okay? All right, let's try this. A workman, this is someone who's busy. So we're, we're to be workers uh, for the Lord. And we should not be ashamed of being that, that uh, our work is what it should be. If our work is truly what it ought to be, dokimos, that is, it is approved. It has been assayed and be, been found to be genuine. Then it does it. We don't have to be ashamed of it. There's no reason for us to be ashamed. There's no cause to be ashamed. And so he's by implication teaching us that we need to, we will need to be ashamed if we, our work isn't what it ought to be. <clears throat> now watch here, he says, handling a right. And this is the prefix ortho. And ortho is, uh, is straight. I'm going to break this word up, but I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't, we don't, if it was a, a Microsoft word, I could. But the first three letters, those that have had Greek or ortho and orthopedic or also orthodontist, it's the word straight. It's straight. And tomao is to cut. So it's from this. Also tomao. So it's to cut a straight line or something straight. And so this is what that word means. It's a participle, and it explains the ver it's explaining 
the verb present, present. And so to present, how do you present yourself for proof? Well, by cutting a straight line, cutting the word of God straight. Now, it's, I think of uh, whenever I'm doing this, I think of someone who's cutting a piece of cloth to make a garment of some sort. And they want to cut it straight, they want to cut it right, cut it by the pattern. And uh, that's that's basically what he's telling them to do. So there's a way, there's some straight way of cutting or or handling, uh, dealing with it, uh, cutting it straight. In a figurative sense, you're not cutting it like cutting the book, but you're handling it right, the word of truth. Some workmen ought to be ashamed because they do not please their master. Now let's let's look at this. It is the word. Handling it right, the word, and this is the word logos, and that's the collected thoughts. It comes from the verb lego, and my mouse will move over that verb here. And that verb means something that is assembled, and it's a collected thoughts on something. And so it's a gathering together in the mind. And it's according to a twofold use term, it's distinguished one that relates to speaking and relates to thinking. So it's a, and I would like to think of it this way, it's the collected thoughts of the mind of God. That's what it is, the word of God, of the word of truth, say. The word of truth, and what we see here with the word of truth, uh, the singular usage of the word, word, logos, which denotes there's a unity in the scriptures. The whole entirety of the Bible is called the word singular. It's a unit, unified whole, and that's important that we keep that in mind. The Greek word for the truth, by the use of the word logos, we learn that the word of truth is the collected thoughts of the mind of God. And that's what we're seeing here. We need to view the Bible in that light. That's the starting point for viewing the Bible. We view it as collected thoughts of the mind of God. And it's the, the, the word, and uh, this is again logos and uh, we come back as we look at this it's the word of truth it's possible to improperly handle or interpret the word of truth and we see this in second peter three sixteen. as also now this is peter writing about paul as also in all his epistles speaking of them of these things wherein are some things hard to be understood He's telling us that some of Paul's writings are difficult to understand. You have to really study hard, which the ignorant and unsteadfast rest. So there's two classes of people, those who are ignorant. And that doesn't mean stupid. It just means you don't know, you don't have information about this. And unsteadfast rest, or they twist, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Now, we'll look at this much later, perhaps come back again to it. But this passage tells us that Peter is calling the writing of Paul scripture because he says they rest the other scriptures. The word other implies that Paul's writings are scripture. And when they rest or twist them or put them on a torture rack, and that's what that means, to put someone on a torture rack where you stretch them out and you, and you, you stretch them, uh, and twist them around, twist their body around, uh, then they're doing that to the scriptures, trying to make them scream out and, and say what you want them to say. So that's wrong to approach the scriptures in that manner, to try to twist them to make them say what you want. That's called eisegesis, and that's what we read into the scriptures, what we think and what we want them to say. Instead of exegesis, is to bring out of them what God intended to be understood. It's possible to properly handle or interpret the word of truth. This is what this is saying, but it's also possible to improperly handle it. Timothy was expected to know the difference between sound hermeneutics, handling right, and unsound hermeneutics, not handling the word of truth right. So he was told to handle it aright, implying that he knew the difference. 
So there's an implication here of him knowing the difference. As we study further Ecclesiastes 12.12, 12, it's not easy. The, we can grow weary. Uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, and furthermore, my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. If you've ever uh, taken some real intensive courses in college, sometimes you'll study and get very tired from it. Uh, it takes a lot of brain energy to do a lot of heavy thinking. And so this can make you weary. But it's a good feeling when you, you study God's word and you you see, you get some what I call aha moments. I, I see that now. And uh, I call those my aha moments. I see it now. And I understand this better than I did before. Peter tells us that some things are hard to be understood. In 2 Peter 3, 16, as we've already said, seen. But they're not impossible, just difficult. So sometimes it challenges us. I think the Bible is a book that uh, a person who is somewhat uh, average, an average person can read it and understand. He get, gets uh, messages out of it. There may be some things he won't understand, but I think the, the, I'm convinced that the things that are most uh, fundamental in our, uh, to our salvation are the things that are laid out in a simple form. And the other things uh, that we find uh, frequently require more study. But what we have to do is we have to start putting things together. And we uh, begin to assimilate more and more information. And then things begin to piece together like a jigsaw puzzle. I view it that way. So as in all of his epistles, as also in all his epistles, speaking of these things, as Peter writing a Paul, we've already looked at this verse before, when are some things hard to be understood, which the ignorant and steadfast rest, as they do also the other scriptures, under their own destruction. So it's not impossible, it's just sometimes it's more difficult. Some passages are harder to understand than others. I think the book of Romans is, is one that you have to really dig into and to understand it. But I think it can be understood, but you have to be very careful and study it uh, with a an open mind and let the Bible lead you to the truth of what Paul is saying in the book of Romans. Now, I just pick Romans. Uh, Hebrews uh, requires a, a good amount of study, but we'll look at that. Hebrews 5.11 says, of whom we have many things to say and heart of interpretation, seeing you become dull of hearing. So now then, this is telling us that we have to, we have to get our mind such that we're not dull of hearing. For when by reason of time you ought to be teachers, you have need again that someone teach you the rudiments of the first principles of the oracles of God, because such that you need of milk and not of solid food. So he uses some elementary doctrines and uh, he calls them the rudiments of the first principles. That probably is their understanding even of the law of Moses. That's probably what that's talking about. But uh, he says you have need of milk uh, and not of solid food. And so your your development, development in the spiritual sense is not much beyond childhood or infancy. And that's how he likens them there. Now, <clears throat> right here, uh, you have to have milk instead of solid food. And of course, we understand about little children. Verse 13 continues, for everyone that partake of the milk is without experience of the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now, we won't get into all of the subtle differences in the words here, but this person here has to have experience. So it requires that we study God's word and make application of it to our lives. So we have to experience it. But solid food is for full grown men, adults, see, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. We have to exercise our senses. So this now is going to require knowledge of God's word of what is right and wrong. And I would advise you to go back to Isaiah 7, 14 through 16 and see that children 
had to learn, had to be, had to be, had to learn, had to know, come to a point of knowing uh, to refuse the evil and choose the good. So they had to exercise their senses to know good and evil, see? So they had to discern good and evil. And that requires a, more of a knowledge of the scriptures. It's necessary to exercise our senses in order to understand the truth. And in this case, to, to discern good and evil, the difference. Sometimes some things, some people can say, I don't see anything wrong with that. And they haven't studied the scriptures thoroughly enough to understand that what they're doing is wrong. And it requires a diligent study of God's word sometimes to see the difference. The Mioker first principle is written in such a manner that an uneducated man can understand them. It will challenge even the most brilliant and educated man. The Bible can challenge you. I don't think you'll ever master it if you live to be 120 years old and study it diligently. I think you'll learn more and more. I know this, I'm not necessarily a brilliant man, but I keep learning. I learn again and again, and I see some things more clearly as I study and keep studying. And I hope to keep studying all my life, and I hope I can keep a mind that's able to study and uh, my body and my mind wear out at the same time. But I Factors are involved in resting or twisting the scriptures, 2 Peter 3.16. Ignorance, that's literal, the literal word there is undisciplined or not taught. And it's uh, the, the discipline comes through like you would discipline a child. So children are to be taught to discern right and wrong, to choose the good and refuse the evil, as Isaiah 7 said. They're unsteadfast. Now, that's a lack of grounding, not sure of self, implies only a superficial knowledge of the truth. That's what this means. They're not grounded. They're, they're, they've got a superficial knowledge of the truth, and so they're not sure of themselves. That's what that idea. Now, I think of it this way. Um, for those who have had some mathematics, this is a Fibonacci curve, but that's something interesting. Uh, just as a side point, uh, a lot of things in nature follow this mathematical relationship. And uh, the atheists can't explain it. I say God is a great mathematician. But I say, the nature of biblical truth, it starts out as a babe and it's like a spiral. And as we grow and learn, we grow and learn more and more. And the spiral goes as we start in the middle and we start going out and we get more and more knowledge. And as we keep growing, we, our knowledge gets bigger and bigger. And it just keeps going on. And I believe, uh, I always like to view it in that way, that that's how we learn and we just keep on learning. And, and if you live to be 120 years old, I don't think you'll fathom all of the depths of the Bible. Uh, you'll keep learning things. And you take a book written by men, uh, and it's... Some, if it's a deep book, uh, people like in elementary and high school can't understand it unless they're re real geniuses. And if you take a real simple book, it can be mastered by people pretty quickly. See, the Bible is not like any book written by men. You just keep seeing more and more, and you learn more and more as you study. And, uh, you know, you can take an advanced calculus book and uh, a second grade student, unless he's some, somewhat of a brilliant uh, person, uh, a prodigy, a child prodigy in mathematics, and they, they'll look at that and won't even know what's going on in there. So, but the Bible has stuff that will challenge the most brilliant minds, and yet it's still, the babe can still learn. The men's books aren't, aren't written that way, and so that's important. That kind of tells me that this book must be from God. That's, that's how we can see some more information that it's from God. The writings of men, advanced calculus, for example, uh, is totally a mystery in and in 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 an advanced calculus book cannot be understood to integrate by an average person unless they've been trained in it. And so, but the Bible, 
It can be understood to the depth of the person's background by an average person, and they don't get lost in it. They may see some things that are puzzled, puzzling to them, but what they know, they, they aren't, can understand it. And you see, it's just men's books, uh, such as calculus and advanced chemistry or physics or something like that, just not that way. So it's not like any other book. When the Jews, some of them came to take Jesus, they said, never man so spake. I say, never man so wrote. And we take the Bible. So it's, it's different. We come back to this spiral, and that's what we see here. All right. Now, let's take the reader's responsibility. The difficulty in interpretation can be the fault of the reader. We've already seen this, of whom we may have many things to say in heart of interpretation. Seeing you become dull of hearing. You're dull of hearing. All again is like no other book. It's always something. Sometimes we neglect the study of the Old Testament, have the mistaken idea that we do not need to study it. But there are several reasons to study the Old Testament. Keep that in mind. It's an example to us, 1 Corinthians 10, 6. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So they serve as examples. Now, when I joined the Navy in Oster Candidate School back in 1963, we got into the barracks and there were a hundred of us in the barracks and the, the Marine drill sergeant trains the Navy officers. And he came up to me and I was the first one. He looked at me and he told me to give him 25 push-ups. Well, I had I got myself in shape before I went to the, to the camp, to the school, uh, the officer candidate school. And uh, so I gave 25 push-ups and he told me to stand up. And he asked me, who told you to stand up? And I said, you did. I just answered, you did, just immediately. And so he says, you called me a female sheep. And so he had to give him 25 more. So uh, when I was going down, I looked and I saw he was, a, he was a sergeant. But I had learned the Navy ranks. I didn't know the Marines trained them. And so when I come back up, he said, who told you to stand up? And I said, sergeant. And I gave his name. And he said, give me 25 more push-ups. I'm a gunnery sergeant. Well, what I was... I was the very first one he picked on, and I was an example to everybody else of what not to do. Does that make sense? So what we have here is there are two kinds of examples. There are positive and negative examples, and we have both kinds, and uh, we have them here in uh, the New Testament, uh, well, even in the Old Testament. But it was written for our learning, the Bible was, was there things were written aforetime were written for our learning that through the patience and through comfort of the scripture we might have hope. So the scriptures that this is the Old Testament scriptures of which he's speaking, and that gives us uh, causes us to be patient and learn comfort of the scriptures and have hope. So there's several things that we get from the scriptures, and this will be the Old Testament scriptures. All scripture, remember, this is profitable. This is American Standard. All scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. We don't see this in our text, in our English text, but this is pretty emphatic, completely, completely. And it's emphatic here. So it furnishes us completely, and it's very emphatic. So you might put this in bold print. I don't know how else to do it to make it emphatic. So all scripture, and this includes the Old and New Testament here in this context. It certainly includes the Old Testament. And I believe it would include the New Testament. It all is profitable for teaching, for, for, for proof. As to reproofs to shed light upon what's right and wrong, and that's defined in the third chapter of the book of John. 
for correction, that's to straighten us out. For instruction, that's the word for training us to be with a child in righteousness and what is uh, what is the proper standard of right and wrong, righteousness. Now, summarize this. We're going to have to elaborate on these four points on the next lesson. We've laid some more foundation here for this. We're obligated to handle right, cut straight the word of truth. The word of truth is the collected thoughts of the mind of God. Keep that in mind. Study takes effort. It can even make us weary. The disciple is responsible for both his attitudes and his method of study. So we have to have the right attitude. We have to have the right method. That cut it straight. The scriptures are unique. They're one of a kind. They're different than any other book. They can be understood by a babe in Christ. He can know what he what he knows, and he can learn things. He won't get necessarily lost. But he, most mature child of God and a, and a person who is very brilliant can still be challenged by the scriptures. So they'll challenge even the most mature, yet they won't cause the babe, the newborn one, to get lost. And so he can learn things and uh, get it. Whereas man's books are not that way. You take an advanced chemistry book, a graduate level, or physics, or mathematics, or something like that, and you can get lost in it if you don't have the background to study it. But you don't do that with the Bible. The more we learn, the more we see how things fit together. It's like that jigsaw puzzle. We just keep putting things together. We, we must study the Bible as a unit. That's important that we have to approach it as a unit. Are there questions? I've got a question, Marion. Hey, it's uh, more of a question about a commentary on that, which you wrote in second which I'm sorry, which you read in 2 Peter 3.16, and that of Paul, when Peter's given a description of Paul's writing. So can we see that the church is made up of three classifications of individuals? We see the learned, the unlearned, and those tossed to and fro. Uh, yes, uh, probably we could classify them that way. Um, but... We see here the, the learned, those are educated, and uh, these people normally would have, in order to grasp fully the scriptures, it takes the right attitude of heart. And if you don't have that proper attitude, you, you'll have trouble with the scriptures, okay? So, yes, I, I think there may be. Quite possibly, or I'm trying to find the passage that you're looking at. Yes. As also in all his epistles, speaking of them, these things were are some things hard to be understood, which he the, the, has two categories, ignorant and unsteadfast, but these are the ones who rest the scripture. So that's two categories, ignorant and unsteadfast. So we need to elaborate on these. These, these people right here, ignorant, may just not understand enough and they have a good heart. Right. Instead, right. But we but have, the ignorant the ignorant wouldn't be so much as steadfast, but you have the ignorant and the steadfast, which are two different. Yeah, right? the steadfast is the second category. I think right. it's someone who's who's uh, maybe has some more knowledge, but they, they waver back and forth on on what the, what is right. So with these people are resting, the sound of the brethren, the ones who's solid, they're not going to twist the Bible. They're going to follow what it teaches. So, yes, I think there probably would be three categories. And then there's all different degrees of knowledge in the, in the congregation. And you, you, you have some who are babes in Christ and some who are, who are mature. And uh, so you got all different degrees of people. And uh, so, again, they're at different developmental stages. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right.